Hey everybody, I'm Bruce Horn. Um, Doing a self-introduction. What? Doing a oh, self-introduction. Self yeah, I'm actually an old friend of Rhoda's from forever ago. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, know my background, but it's from uh, Xerox Park, Apple, and so on and so on. At, and now I'm at uh, Intel. So uh, I'm going to try and talk a about a couple of things that uh, hopefully will make you think a little bit. Probably you already know all of this, but I just want you to think a little bit more about how, how to think about language, really. So I love this quote from Licklider. You know, in not too many years, human brains and computing machines, because we are talking about computers and text, right, will be coupled together very tightly, and the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought. So what does that mean? That means that the, the, the computer partner has to do some thinking and has to do some understanding of, of what you're working on, and you have to, it has to have some sort of shared representation with you so that you can work together with it. So I'm going to go very fast through this, so anyone can just interrupt me at any time. So how do we do that? How do we improve society's collective IQ, you know, as Engelbart was trying to do? Um, you have to have a shared context, and that's actually one of the biggest problems right now. So if I say the word climate change to somebody, how they interpret it will be completely different depending on the context that they come from. If they're Fox News you know, uh, watchers, they'll have a certain set of associations, a certain set of beliefs and understanding about that. If, they're, if you're talking to somebody from um, you know, NCAR who's you know, doing studies in this area, they'll have a different area of understanding and different set of associations. So it's completely different. So having a shared context is absolutely prerequisite for even people or computers to even understand each other. So learning and reasoning, that has to happen over the shared context, and it has to be with processes that are shared that people actually understand and agree upon. And then there have to be models of the world that people agree upon. So this is actually touching back on all the stuff that everybody's been talking about today. Um, so I want to ask everybody here, every, everybody here understands English, right? Everybody understands English. Raise your hand if you think you understand English. OK, everybody understands English. So please tell me this. What does this mean? The failure is an SX reset cycling issue, blah, blah, blah. What does that mean? But it's English, right? I think. But what does that mean? Actually, that's a bug, a bug that was reported by one of the component debug engineers at Intel bringing up a new chip. So the shared model that that person had with the other debug engineers is necessary, where we don't share that model at all. So one of the things we were trying to do is, let's say you're a debug engineer and you're trying to bring up some new, uh, some new chip and you're seeing something like this and you have no idea really what this, you know, whether anyone else has seen this. How do you know? You have a hundred other debug engineers who are looking at this. How do you know whether they've already seen it or not? So. So, um, sounds just as bad as the other one. Okay. So how do you do that? Well, let's say you want to try and save a bunch of time and say, somebody else has already seen this probably. How do we find that out? Well, you have to go and look through the debug database, and there's 20,000 bugs there, and you have to read every single one of the descriptions. And then you put it in, the mo in your mind and say, yes, this is like that bug. <coughs> so over the last few years, um, I've been working on natural language understanding coming from PowerSet, which, where we indexed all of Wikipedia and we could ask questions and then actually get facts back rather than pages. And we had a fact-based index and we understood how to parse and understand, uh, you know, process text. So what we did was we read this and we normalized it, did a bunch of computer kind of, you know, NLP on it. And then we basically said, can we say if there's a similarity between this text and this other text that somebody described? And it turned out we could do that, and we could actually cut the um, debug time for, for a particular bug from two weeks to four minutes. So what I'm trying to say here is, depending on what you're looking at, maybe this, your system has to have a, a model about what you're talking about in order for you to communicate with it. 
So these words mean something to people who have a context and a set of understandings for those words. So let's, let's just go into one of the words, like CRISPR. Does everybody know what CRISPR means? So does that help you understand a little bit more about what that means? Probably not. The whole point here is that there's a lot of understanding that could be um, supported by the computer if the computer actually understood the text as well. And if the computer had a context and a set of associations internally and in, in, in some sort of associative memory, that it would basically be able to understand and then explain to you. So, so I like to say that reading text is a low bandwidth process for eliciting and changing associations in your personal context. So again, if I say Barack Obama, um, all of a sudden a bunch of associations light up in your brain and you're ready for the next thing I might say or you're ready to interpret the next word in an interesting way. Like if I say Michelle, it's not just any Michelle. Okay, so everything is understood in relationship to some context and context is everything other than what you're focusing on. So it's just, a, I just wanted to explain to you some of these things about ways of thinking about context and language and to experiment yourselves when you start to hear words and you start to listen to the radio and you hear words coming across the radio and you think about how long it might take for you to understand what they're talking about. What's the process that's going on there? Just to experiment yourself. And I love this quote. I'm going to finish with this quote. So everything is about relationship and connectivity and association. So creativity is just connecting things. So I won't read this, but Steve Jobs knew better than anybody where creativity came from. It came from having experiences and associating those experiences in new ways. So could we have computer systems that actually understand text that way, understand the world that way, make models, and allow you to ask questions about that? And we're doing a lot of that work now. And so I, I actually really like this. Uh, this is from Doug's uh, 40, 40th anniversary, Augmenting Human Intellect and Raising the Collective IQ. Um, so the question is, what's next? What, do, what can we do next with computing and text? Right now, text is really, it's, it's basically static, or maybe it's a little bit dynamic where you can click on something. But is there a way for text to be even more dynamic where the computer understanding of the text is part of your experience of the text. So that's all I had. I just, you know, I wrote this over lunch because Frodo asked me to do it. And that's it. So the question is, where's Intel in this? Well, um, if it computes, it's supposed to compute best on, in, on Intel processors and then Intel architectures. Um, you know, the future is basically understanding big data, understanding the world and models and language. So we have to really understand how um, these systems actually work. And eventually what we'd like to do is build cognitive hardware, you know, hardware that thinks like people do. So we're doing some research in that area. And this is part of it. You know, obviously, so much of human knowledge is bound up in text and language. And of course, there's huge, huge, huge uh, efforts in visual understanding and cataloging uh, giant collections of images from all over the, all over the world. Um, all that stuff has to come together for a kind of full understanding and figuring out how to compute over all of that is where Intel comes in.
Well, yeah, abstraction is one thing, but just contextual understanding is another. So what does the word hit mean? What does the word hit mean? You know, it could be many, many things, right? It could be many things. It could be a hit record, or it could be a hit in baseball, right? And um, one of the things that we, you know, we've looked into is things like the naive semantic model, where if you look at something like the word buy, you and you're talking about buying something, it means you have something to buy something with, and before you have more of it, and less you have, after you have less of it, plus some other, other thing, right? So you, might, you can have some logical connections to the words as well, and the activities and processes. And a lot of those things uh, have barely begun to be modeled. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.